of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for another Bible Preach session this very blessed Friday evening at 7 p.m. in at Sydney uh, local time. We pray all of our beloveds who are watching us live this very moment, wherever you are, we pray that you're always in good health and in good spirit. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you always and forevermore. Amen. If I could encourage everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and evermore. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we come into our topic of this evening, I will, leave, I will leave you with this uh, church hymn. Let us all come into contemplation as we listen to this beautiful hymn. God bless. Well, the great I am. Amen to that. And there is only one I am, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy name. Amen. My beloved, just a couple of announcements before we go on to the topic. Uh, a reminder again uh, to all our beloved parents and our teenage uh, boys and girls, our sons and daughters, that every Thursday at 7 p.m. we are doing um, live talk with our beloved teenagers. If you have any uh, children from the age of, of 12 and above, 12 years of age and above, uh, you can visit the church website or the Facebook, which is Christ the Good Shepherd Church, either the website or the Facebook, and you will see a link there, um, register online. It is every Thursday at 7 p.m. sharp. Also, um, 
we were going to make um, some announcements about visiting the church in our services. Uh, however, uh, there is always changes happening uh, every day. Uh, there is the uncertainty of what is happening with the, with the rules according to these lockdowns, etc., etc. So unfortunately, we were hoping that by the 11th of October, things would have eased but looks like um, it is not the case as yet. Uh, we will actually keep you informed, my beloveds, um, as we go along. We're praying that uh, next week we will be hearing some good news uh, from, the, um, from the government. Uh, may the Lord Jesus intervene swiftly and bring uh, an end to this situation uh, that has gone extremely too far. My beloveds, today or this evening, we are continuing our journey with Christ. And I believe it is the 10th um, episode or the 10th session. And um, I believe it's going to be the last one this evening. And we will be reverting to the commentary on the book of Revelation in English uh, coming next Friday and there, uh, thereafter. So this Friday is the last Friday as far as journey with Christ is concerned. And then next Friday we will go back and continue our commentary or explanation uh, or interpretation of the book of Revelation. Well, we spoke in the past nine weeks in details and depth about Genesis chapter 3 and what took place in Genesis chapter 3. And since the fall of man, uh, our father Adam and Eve and the entire human race, we all needed a savior to come along and deliver us uh, from eternal death, eternal condemnation, eternal um, slavery, and from Satan. And the Lord Jesus came in the end of times, as St. Paul mentions in his epistles to the Galatians chapter 4. In the end of, end of times, the Son of God, the second person in the Holy Trinity, comes down into the womb of the Holy Mother, the Virgin of all virgins, Mother Mary, and takes uh, the nature, uh, our human nature, upon himself, and he became man in this realm to save, to deliver, and to redeem the entire world. Um, last time we spoke... Um, you know, when, when the, the Adam and Eve or the human race, when they fell, they, fi they found themselves naked. They needed someone to, co you know, to cover their nakedness. And we spoke also about our father Job, how he needed someone to come and reconcile him back to God. And he asked, is there anyone that can reconcile me back to God now that I have realized that I am a sinner as well? And that question of our father Job was answered in the end of times when Jesus Christ came into this realm and said to Job, I am the mediator between God and man. This evening we're going to be talking about the connection between the rivers that were flowing in the Garden of Eden and the New Testament rivers. So there are rivers in the Old Testament in the Garden of Eden, and we have rivers flowing in the New Testament. We're going to read together from the book of Genesis. This time it is chapter 2. So it is Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 to 14. Genesis 2, 10 to 14. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Um, Delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is uh, Hedekel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. 
The fourth river is the Euphrates. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So when we read in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verses 10 to 14, we see that there are four rivers being mentioned. But prior to that in verse 10, it says that now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. So there was one river that came out of Eden to water the garden. And this river, it got parted into four river heads. So out of this one river, four river heads came out. Uh, Pishon, Gihon, Hedekel, or Tigris, and Euphrates. Now Tigris and Euphrates, the last two rivers mentioned, they are still current in the Middle East and more so in Mesopotamia, Iraq. In Iraq. The, uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates are still there. Um, so this river, out of it, it parted into four river heads. Uh, Pishon, Gihon, Hedekel or Tigris and Euphrates. Now let us come and see what these four rivers, uh, the names of them, what do they mean? The first river is Pishon. Pishon, the word Pishon literally means increase or freely overflowing. Pishon is increase or freely overflowing. The second river is Gihon. Gihon is the flowing spring, the flowing spring. Hedekel or Tigris, it is the sharp voice or fast, as in speed. Sharp voice or fast. And the fourth river, Euphrates, it means super fresh water. It is the ultimate fresh water, Euphrates. This river that came out of the garden, of Eden, to water the garden, out of this river, four river heads came out. We come to the New Testament. The New Testament, we find also four river heads. What are the four river heads of the New Testament? The Gospel of St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the four river heads that were symbolically represented in the Garden of Eden. Now, the Gospel of Matthew is the river head Pishon. The Gospel of St. Mark is Gihon. The Gospel of St. Luke is Hedekel or Tigris. And the Gospel of St. John is Euphrates. When we look again at Genesis 2.10, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. Let's come and see which river was this that came out of Eden to water the garden, and this one river, it became into four river heads. Which river is it? We find it in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Therefore, that one river that came out of Eden to water the garden, and that one river that went out of and became four river heads, that river is the river Jordan, where the Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior, was baptized by John the Baptist. It was the river Jordan. Now, the river Jordan is that river that was coming out of Eden. The word Jordan literally means death. The word Jordan literally means death. The Lord Jesus, when he went to the Jordan River in Matthew chapter 3 to be baptized by John the Beloved, 
when John the Beloved placed his hand on the Lord Jesus' head and submerged him into that water, he was literally saying, this is the Lamb of God that is going to be slain and buried for the salvation and the redemption of the entire world. Jordan death. Jesus Christ of Nazareth came with his own feet, with his own will to face death and embrace death on Calvary on the cross. He came to a river called Jordan, i.e. death. Jesus was born to die for the remission of our sins and to rise from the dead for our justification. Now, this river Jordan, out of death, the Lord Jesus, who is that river Jordan, the river Jordan is the Lord Jesus himself. So out of his death, Four river heads came out of the cross, out of Calvary. The four river heads that came out of Jordan, Jesus Christ, is the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And just like those four river heads watered the entire garden, so as the four gospels came out of the river Jordan, out of death, to water the entire world and give life to a dead world. It is amazing how God operates. You see, God will never intervene until us humans stop working. God will never intervene until us humans stop working. What do I mean by that? God never operates in the possible. God always operates in the impossible. The possible, God left it to the human race to deal with. The impossible, God alone can operate in that level. I'll illustrate furthermore. When the Lord Jesus came back to raise Lazarus, who was dead four days in the grave, in the tomb, the Lord Jesus went back to raise Lazarus. We find that in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. The Lord Jesus said, show me the, the tomb. They showed him. He came, and then he ordered his disciples to remove the rock from the face of the tomb. When they removed the rock, the Lord faced that tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, dead for days, got up and came out. What do we learn from this? The question is, which one was easier for the Lord Jesus to do? With one word, wasn't it easier to move the rock than to raise the dead? I believe moving the rock from the face of the tomb with his word would have been a lot easier to do than raising a dead. But look at how the Lord Jesus functions, operates, he does things. When it came to moving the rock, he asked his disciples to do it. The Lord did not interfere with it. He expected the disciples to remove that rock from the face of the tomb. Why? Because the Lord says, when I see things that human can do, I'll expect them to do it. But when I see things human cannot do, I will never ask them to do it. Removing the rock, humans can do. Raising the dead, only God can do. Therefore, God will never ask no human being to raise the dead, but God will expect us to remove the rock since he already gave us the capacity, the wisdom, the tool to remove the rock. He's already given us that through birth. 
So what we are capable of, God will expect us to do. But what is impossible, God will never ask no one to do it because he knows the impossible is where God operates and God alone. Out of death, Jordan, the Lord Jesus brought out four river heads and river means flowing waters. Water here represents life. Wherever water goes, there is life on that, in that land. So the Lord Jesus, out of death, brought life forth. This is the work of God only. And God is amazing when he does things. Therefore, my beloveds, please pay attention. Whenever any human being, whenever any human being thinks that they can understand, comprehend, fathom God with their intellectual capacity, they are mistaken. Because my entire intellectual capacity is, can only operate under the stand. I can only understand things. When I understand things, I operate in that capacity. The things that I do not understand, I cannot operate. Therefore, my realm, my capacity is the possible. What is the possible? Everything that is under the stand. What is impossible? Everything that is above the stand. God will always operate above the stand, never under the stand. He left the un under the stand for the human to do and the impossible above the stand for him, God alone to do. So when God operates, don't ever use your head to try and comprehend what God has done. Because no matter how hard you try, the ultimate you can achieve is under the stand. But everything God does is above the stand. Therefore, you need one thing. You need to have faith in God and you need to trust in God. Otherwise, using your head, forget it. It's impossible. Out of the river Jordan, four river heads came, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these are the four rivers in the Garden of Eden, Pishon, Gihon, Hedekel, or Tigris, and Euphrates. Now, why is there four Gospels? Some may ask, didn't the Lord Jesus have 12 apostles? How come there was not 12 Gospels written? Why only four? Why not three? Why not seven? Why not any other number but four? For one simple reason. Every one of us, every one of us, there is four pro profiles to that human being. What I mean by that, four profiles is the face, the front, the back, the right side, and the left side. These are the four, four profiles. And every human being has these four profiles to themselves. The Lord Jesus, as a human being, also perfect man on earth, there was four profiles to him. When... When the apostles came to write about the Lord Jesus, and I'm talking here symbolically in a way, when, the, when the, the, the apostles came to write about the Lord Jesus, each one looked at one profile of the Lord. Therefore, there had to be four, no more, no less, because the four profiles make up the perfect picture of who Jesus Christ is is all about so Saint Matthew came looked at the Lord Jesus and he saw the Son of Man 
the Messiah, meaning God, the Messiah, the anointed one, he says, I saw him as the son of man. That's why when you read in the gospel of St. Matthew, the title son of man is used more than any other gospel. So he saw the Messiah as the son of man. That was the gospel of St. Matthew. This was the, one of the profiles of the Lord Jesus. St. Matthew wrote to the Jews and he said, the Messiah that you've been waiting for, I saw him, I met him. He is the son of man. He is one of us, human being. So St. Matthew wrote to the Jews and introduced Jesus Christ, the King, the Messiah, as the Son of Man. St. Mark looked at the Lord Jesus from a different profile and St. Mark wrote to the Romans. That's why you see that the Gospel of St. Mark is the shortest out of the other three Gospels. It is the shortest Gospel that consists of 16 chapters only. St. Matthew, the longest Gospel, 28 chapters. St. Mark, 16 only. Why? Because St. Mark is writing to the Romans. Romans are the mighty warriors. They are the conquerors of the land. They reign over the whole world. They control the world. Kings, warriors. So he's writing to the Romans and he's saying to them, if you think you are strong, I, today I am introducing to you the one who is the strongest of all, Jesus Christ. That's why the Gospel of St. Mark begins with the following. The Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Son of God. Now, to get to Jesus Christ being Son of God, it took the entire chapter of St. Matthew to get to Son of God eventually. It took the entire chapter to get to Son of God. St. Mark did it in one verse only. Why? Because Romans are not interested about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. They don't care about King David. They don't care about Abraham. They don't care about, about these people. They don't even know who these people are. And they wouldn't even care about them. All they care about, we want to see who is the strongest of all. Now, God is the ultimate power in existence. God is the ultimate power in existence. God is the ultimate mightiness in existence. So he's, say, he's talking to the Romans, the, 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 the strongest people. He says, well, you know what? The, Jesus, the one I'm introducing to you, is the son of God, the ultimate authority, the, the ultimate sovereign authority and power. That's why his gospel is the shortest. Because with powerful people, you need to take shortcuts. They are not interested about beating around the bush, as we say. We come to the Gospel of St. Luke. St. Luke looked at the Lord Jesus from a different profile, and he saw the perfect servant. Let me go back just one step. St. Matthew looked at the Lord Jesus. He saw the Messiah as the Son of Man. St. Mark looked at the Lord Jesus, and he saw the perfect king. Because he's talking about the Roman king's empire, which is, which is controlled by the king and, 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 and ruled by the king. So he's saying, you're a king. Today I'm introducing to you the king of all kings, the ultimate power, the ultimate authority. So St. Mark introduces the Lord Jesus as the perfect king. Matthew sees the Lord as the Son of Man. Mark sees the Lord as the perfect king and introduces this perfect king to the Romans. St. Luke, on the other hand, looks from a different profile and sees the Lord Jesus as the perfect servant. 
and he introduces this perfect servant to the Greeks. Now, the Greeks were the philosophers, the wise people of their time. Socrates, Plato, and the likes, people of, of great calibers of wisdom. But when any human being reaches a very high level of wisdom and knowledge, they tend to see themselves much higher than the rest of people. They see themselves more elevated than the rest. They are more educated, more knowledgeable, and they see themselves as first-class citizens, and everyone else is a second-class citizen. So a wise man tend to have self-pride. I am better than the rest. St. Luke speaks to the philosophers, the wise people of their time, and he says, if you think you are wise, today I am introducing to you the source of all wisdom. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But guess what, my beloved Greek people? This source of wisdom is the perfect servant, not master, as you are. Wisdom, true wisdom, will give you humility. True wisdom will give you humility. He says, Jesus Christ is the source of wisdom, but I'm introducing the Lord to you, my beloved Greeks, as the perfect servant. Wisdom is when we are servants, not masters. This is a true wise man. The Gospel of St. John. John the Beloved, the Apostle of Christ, he looked at the fourth profile of the Lord Jesus and he saw the perfect God. And he introduced this perfect God to the entire world. John the Beloved begins his gospel with the following. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John the Beloved looks at the fourth profile of the Lord and he sees the perfect God and introduces this perfect God to the entire world. When we put these four profiles together, we see the perfect picture of Jesus Christ. And this perfect picture is illustrated and revealed perfectly in the four river heads that went out to water the entire world and gave life to this dying world, or rather, dead world. So let us put the four profiles together and see who Jesus Christ truly is. We take the Gospel of St. Matthew, the Son of Man, perfect man. Perfect man, the Gospel of St. Matthew. We take the Gospel of John, perfect God. We take the Gospel of St. Mark, perfect king. And we take the Gospel of St. Luke, perfect servant. Perfect man, Gospel of Matthew, Perfect God, Gospel of John. Perfect King, Gospel of Mark. Perfect Servant, Gospel of Luke. Let us put it together. Divinity in the Gospel of John was revealed in the end of times in humanity in the Gospel of Matthew. Came to this world to be king over your life in the Gospel of Mark to serve you in the Gospel of Luke and not you serve him. I'll say it again. Divinity in the Gospel of St. John was revealed in the end of times 
um, and, and the perfect man in humanity, Gospel of Matthew, came to this world to be king over your life in the Gospel of Mark, to serve you and not you serve him in the Gospel of Luke. This is our sweetheart, beloved, the love of our life, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Divinity revealed in humanity came as king to rule over your life. And this king came to serve you, not you serving him. Absolute and total difference between Christ the king and any other earthly and worldly kings. All the kings of the world, they expect everyone to go and serve them. When it comes to Jesus Christ, the king of all kings, he will never expect you to serve him. He came to serve you himself to serve you the perfect servant Jesus Christ of Nazareth all glory to his holy name another thing about these rivers when you read in the gospel of Saint Matthew Saint Matthew focused on everything the Lord Jesus said. Saint Matthew focused on everything the Lord Jesus said. When you read in the Gospel of Saint Luke, Saint Luke focused on everything the Lord Jesus did, not said. My beloveds, when we read the Holy Bible in any chapter of the Holy Bible, we need to understand this thing very clearly, and it is so important. Every chapter of the Bible, every book in the Holy Bible has a key, a certain key that opens that book. Musically speaking, for a, prof for a professional musician, when they come to play this uh, piece of in, like music, they have this musical chart placed right before them. In every musical chart, there is the key note in a different color at the top, at the top corner. That key note, usually it is in red, and every other note is written in black. That professional musician will look at the key note first before they look at the chart in its totality. That key tells them what scale this entire musical piece is played at. Is it, a, is, it, is it a scale of C minor, D minor, whichever scale it is. So when they look at the key, and let's say the key says it is C minor, that professional musician, without looking at the chart, they automatically know what chords will come and are relevant in the C minor scale? They will know. So all they need to do, just breeze through it, and they will know exactly what they are playing. Because the key gave them the information on how to read and interpret the musical chart. In this concept and in this approach, when we come to read the Gospel of St. John, for example, we need to use the right key. Otherwise, if we use the wrong key, guess what? We will read the entire cha chart wrongfully. We will ruin the entire musical piece. But when we use the right key, will open the book with the right key, guess what? We will interpret the entire contents of this book absolutely correctly. So when you approach the Gospel of John as the depth of theology and as the depth of the divinity of Christ, then you will fathom and understand what is the content of the Gospel of John and so on with every single book in the entire Holy Bible from Genesis 
Old Testament to Revelation, New Testament. We need to use the right key. So when some people read the four Gospels, they say there are differences. But we've heard and we believe the Holy Bible is the Word of God and it is the perfect Word of God. How come there are discrepancies? No, my beloved, there are no discrepancies. It is just, it's a matter of you using the right key to open the book with the right key. When you open it with the right key, everything falls into place and into perfect clarity and understanding. So when we read the four Gospels, St. Matthew is focusing on the teaching of the Lord, the teachings of the Lord, whatever the Lord said. Luke focused on whatever the Lord did. When you read um, in the book of Revelation, I'm going to actually... Um, bring it out for in a moment. Book of Revelation, chapter 4, and verse 7. Let's go to Book of Revelation, and we're going to read chapter 4 and verse 7. And you see also this in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 10. The Holy Bible when we get to learn how it is structured, that alone is enough proof that God exists. There is no human intelligence that can put the Holy Bible in this perfection. Just the structure, the way the Holy Bible is structured, it is enough proof that definitely God exists. Because it's amazingly perfect. There is no enough intelligence, neither in the angelic nor in the human level, to be able to put this book in this absolute perfection and completion. Only God is capable of doing such a thing. Now, when we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 7, in this verse, it talks about the symbols of these four rivers. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Their symbols. What are, they symb what are they symbolized as? It says, The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. These are the four symbols of the four Gospels. The first living creature was like a lion, the gospel of St. Mark. St. Mark introduces the perfect king. The lion is the king of the jungle. So symbolically, the lion represents the Lord Jesus, the lion being the king. Symbolically, it represents Jesus Christ is the king of all kings. So the first living creature was like a lion, the gospel the symbol of the gospel of St. Mark. The second living creature like a calf. This represents symbolically the gospel of St. Luke. Now why calf is symbolically is the symbol of St. Luke's gospel? Because St. Luke introduces the Lord Jesus as the perfect servant. Let's bring this calf. The calf, my beloved, all it does, all its life, it works plows the ground and grinds the wheat. It works all its life. And at the end of its life journey, it gets slain and eaten. The Lord Jesus symbolically is represented by this calf of the Gospel of St. Luke because the Lord Jesus all his life worked on earth and at the end of his ministry, he was slain on the cross and we ate his body and drank his blood. And this is why St. Luke focused on what Jesus did, not on what Jesus said, because the calf works, the calf doesn't talk, 
the Lord Jesus and the Gospel of Luke, read it, my beloveds. You will see St. Luke saying, and the Lord Jesus went to this village, and, and, and he healed the people of this village, and he went to this city, and from this city he went to another city. He was going from one place to the other, doing wonders, miracles, healings, and reaching out to those people who were afflicted. Jesus is working nonstop in the gospel of St. Luke. He is that calf, and he is that fatted calf that the father had slain when he received his prodigal son back from the pig's field. When he said, my son was dead and now is alive. My son was lost and now is found. He said, kill the fatted calf. The fatted calf is Jesus Christ. He worked all his life and at the end of his life's journey, he got killed and eaten. The third living creature had a face like a man, the Gospel of Saint Matthew. The Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. The third living creature had a face like a man. And what does a man do? Talks. That's why Saint Matthew focused on everything the Lord Jesus said. That's why the Gospel of Matthew, the story that he writes, and St. Luke also writes, there are, they are called synop synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic Gospels means they have similar stories. The stories are being written in these three Gospels very similarly. However, what Luke wrote and what St. Matthew wrote, what St. Matthew wrote was much longer and more in details than what St. Luke wrote. Why? Because since St. Matthew focused on what the Lord Jesus said, then he wrote everything that the Lord Jesus said. Obviously, that took much longer than just saying what Jesus did. When you do something, it's right there and then. But to actually elaborate on that deed, it takes pages to elaborate on the deed that happened in a split second. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Flying eagle, my beloved, is the gospel of Saint John. The depth of theology flying in the heaven of the divine Messiah, Jesus Christ. The eagle, out of all the birds of the sky, can fly very high altitudes. No other bird can go that high except the eagle. So flying high altitudes in the sky, meaning the Gospel of John is the depth of divinity, is the depth of theology. It is it takes you into the highly elevated spirituality, the spiritual being of Christ. So when you fly high in the heaven of Christ, you are likened unto that eagle where you soar so highly in, heaven, in the heaven of the Lord Jesus. Another feature or characteristics of the eagle the eagle can stare into the sun, S-U-N, can look straight into the sun without, without the eagle's vision being impaired or, 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 or affected. The eagle can look straight into the sun with no issues. Us humans, we cannot. We get, we get blinded. But the eagle looks with clarity. You see, when you come into the teachings of the divine, when you come into the insight of the, the theology of Christ, your eyes will be opened in the spiritual realm where you begin to see the divine Christ without being blurry vision, without having blurry vision, without having your vision affected in any way, form, or shape. 
When your eyes are opened spiritually, you will see Christ so clearly without going blind. And the eagle sees from about five or seven miles away um, a rabbit. He can, he can pinpoint a rabbit from about you know, five to seven miles away. When you come into the spiritual life and you begin to grow in spirituality, you get to know the divine, you get to know the depth of theology, your vision will be so sharp, you will detect every moving object in your, in your, in your path. You will know Satan from a hundred zillion miles away. You don't need to think about it twice. You will, you, will, you will recognize the voice of the good shepherd from the voice of the enemy. You will clearly know it without any hard efforts being made. Your vision will be so sharp. You will know if it is Satan or if it is the Lord. He will know very clearly. Now, these are the four gospels. These are the four rivers. Pishon, Gihon, Hedekel, or Tigris, Euphrates. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these are the four profiles that make up the, uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in absolute perfect picture. Divinity, John, revealed in humanity, Matthew, came to this world as the king, Mark, to serve us and not us serving him in the gospel of St. Luke. Perfect picture of the Messiah. Now, I'm going to leave you with this. In the gospel of John... Chapter 1, verse 1, as we read earlier, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Ever since man, man failed and fell of the glory of God, we lost that image that God created us with or in, and we, we became totally detached from God, totally separated from God. We lost everything forever. Now, I need to be reconnected with God again. I need to be reconnected with God again. How can I do that? And as we mentioned last time, Job asked this question. Okay, I'm a sinner. I acknowledge, I confess. But is there anyone that can reconcile me back to God? Is there a mediator between us, God, and me? The Lord Jesus came to bring us back to God. And not only bring us back to God, but by doing that or by doing so, revealing God to us. Now this, no one can ever do. There is no angel that can reveal God to us. There is no human being, no matter how holy you are, no matter how mighty of a prophet you are, impossible for you to reveal God to me. Impossible. No matter how much of a message you bring to me, there is no way in the world you will reveal the fullness of God to me. Jesus Christ, when we come to the Gospel of John, why did the Gospel writer introduce the Lord Jesus as the Word? In the beginning was the Word. Why as the Word? Now, when we read in the Greek text, which is the original text of the New Testament, the word in Greek means logos. Logos is intellect, the brain. So in the beginning was the brain, and the brain was with God, and the brain was God. But St. John introduces the Lord as the Word. 
For one reason, my beloved. Now this word is the Son of God. As Christians, we believe in one God, but this one God is Trinity, three in one and one in three at the same time. He is the Father, He is the Son, He is the Holy Spirit, one God in essence, one God in nature. Amen. So we believe in one God, 100%. But this one God cannot be just one. It's impossible. He is one in three and three in one. And we spoke before about this. But I want to focus, and I'll leave you with this, on why Jesus Christ is introduced by John the Beloved in the Gospel of John as the Word. Because the Word, my Beloved, in itself operates in three different ways, just like the Trinitarian God is three in one and one in three. So as the Word operates in three ways, but it remains as one Word. Number one, the Word reveals the speaker. Number two, the Word establishes relationships. Number three, the Word commands or gives an order. One, the Word reveals the speaker. Two, the Word establishes relationships. Number three, the Word gives an order or commands. If I stand before you and say absolutely nothing to you, you will never be able to understand or, or know what is in my heart and what is in my mind unless I speak. If I stand still with no talking, you will never be able to know what is in my heart and what is in my mind. The moment I speak, I am revealed to you. The moment I speak, what was in my heart and what was in my mind now is apparent, is like an open book before you. You've read it, you've understood what was inside of me. The Word revealed the speaker. God no one had seen. God no one knows Him. God no one can get to Him. God is absolutely unknown, obscure, so distant somewhere high above. This God, the brain, the logos, the Word, and this Word was with God, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word came in the end of times and put on the flesh. When this Word, who is God, came and hid in this flesh, when this person called Jesus Christ of Nazareth, when He spoke, guess what? God spoke, because the Word is God. So when Jesus spoke, God spoke. What did the word what does the word do? The word reveals the speaker. So when the Lord Jesus spoke, God spoke, and when God spoke, the unknown God became known. The invisible became visible. The so far and distant God became so close and near than ever before. The intangible became tangible. So the Word revealed the speaker. The hidden God became revealed through the Word. Secondly, the Word establishes relationships. Any relationship, any relationship, it is only made possible through words. You know, a guy meets a girl and he wants to get to know this girl so he walks up to her and he says hi my name is so and so what's your name the word establishes relationships but there is one thing to every relationship the beginning of any relationship is the name the name is your identity. The name is who you are and what you are. 
Hello, my name is so-and-so. What's your name? The word established relationship and to every relationship beginning is the name. God, the word, came in the flesh and spoke. When he spoke, he became revealed. When he, came, when he became revealed, I've realized that God is all love. God is all love. That's why he created me, created all of us, and everything that is visible and invisible. The spiritual realm and the physical tangible realm. He created both worlds based on true divine love. I realized this when Jesus spoke. I understood God is love. That's why he created everything on the basis of love. Love is the existence to life and to everything that is good and beautiful. When I realized God is love, this God who is all love came to establish a relationship between him and us human beings. So he came to us and he said, hi, the word establishes relationships. He said, hi, and the first thing to the relationship is the name. Hi, my name is Jesus. Yeshua, Yeshua, meaning Yahweh, the Savior. Hi, my name is Emmanuel, Amman El, Amman with us, El, God. Amman El, God is with us. Hi, my name is Yahweh, the Savior. My name is God is with you. Would you like to be a friend with Yahweh the Savior and God who is with you? If we said yes to Jesus Christ and accept this relationship, then the word will come back and gives an order and commands. The word will come back and say, if you love me, then you do what I say to you. And this is exactly what the Lord Jesus said to all of us, to his 12 apostles, to his disciples. He said, this commandment I leave with you prior to ascending to heaven. This commandment I leave with you. Love one another the way I have loved you. In this the world will know you belong to me when you love one another. When you have love for, for one another, the world will know you belong to me, Jesus Christ, who is love. The word came to reveal God to us. We came to know that God is love. And he, he, is, he created everything based on love. And through this love came to establish a relationship with us based and built on this love. And when we accepted this relationship based on love, then this word came back and said, if you love me, then you must do what I command you to do. For it is impossible and illogical when I claim to say that I love someone but I never listen to them. How can you say you love someone and you are always disobedient to them? Your disobedience to them shows absolutely clearly that you do not love them. Because if you did love them, you wouldn't have been disappoint, uh, disobedient to them. So when you love someone from the heart, You'll do anything and everything to please them. In fact, you will go out of your way just to make them happy. Why? Because love does the impossible. This is the Lord. And I'll leave you with this. If anybody says to you as Christians, I'm talking to my beloved Christians here and to all our listeners, but this is to you as Christians. 
If anybody says to you, you must pray, you must fast, you must read the Holy Bible, you must go to church, you must do charitable deeds, I'll say to that person, that is not Christianity. There is no such thing as you must do this in Christianity. I'll, I'm saying this with all love and respect. All the religions of the world are absolutely and totally different to Christianity. The moment we invoke the word religion, automatically we are invoking a set of rules, guidelines, regulations, and laws. The moment we invoke the word religion, we are automatically invoking rules, guidelines, regulations, and laws. That's why in all the religions of the world, with all love and respect, when you go to them, they will say to you, if you want to end up in a good place, you must do this and this and this and this. If you do not do this and this and this and this, your place will be very ugly. Christianity, there is no such thing as you must do this and this and this. In this sense, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a belief in a person called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory be to his holy name. It is a belief in the person. Since we are coming to believe in a person, therefore that relationship between that person and us, us and that person is based on love because my beloved love cannot exist with laws, guidelines, regulations, and conditions. Love cannot exist with law. Law doesn't know love. Law knows one thing. You break the law, the law breaks you. Love knows something else. You break me, I still forgive you. You walk away from me, I still tolerate you. You hurt me, I still embrace you. Love is totally different. Love can only exist between people, not laws. I can't love law. I can only love a human like me. That's why God became a human like me. So that way he gave me the opportunity to fall in love with him and enter this relationship in holiness. Yes? In holiness, purity, elevated, so heavenly, up high. Not earthly, filthy way of thinking. No. Our relationship with the Lord is pure, is holy, is heavenly, highly elevated, not filthy, earthly. So God became man to give me the opportunity to enter a relationship with him based on love because love only exists between people. Since Christianity is a belief in this person called Jesus Christ of Nazareth, then there is no such thing as you must pray you must read the Bible, Holy Bible. You must go to church. You must fast. You must do charitable deeds. No such thing. Then what it is? What is it? I'll ask you this. Do you love the Lord Jesus? If any Christian says yes, if any Christian says yes, then my question to you, if you love the Lord, shouldn't you go to church? If you love the Lord, shouldn't you read the Holy Bible? If you love the Lord, shouldn't you be praying? If you love the Lord, shouldn't you be doing charitable deeds? Wow, the difference is absolutely like heaven and earth so far away. 
If I am placed in a situation where I must pray, then there is no love. I'm doing it as a duty, not as a son. I'm doing it as a slave. Because only love is non-existent between master and the slave, but love is existent between father and son. Therefore, a slave does things with no love in it because he is obligated to do it. As a son, I'm not obligated. I am willingly choosing to do it. And that's where the whole difference is. Because unless you love God, how can you say <laughs> you're praying to him? You are worshiping him. You are reading his holy word. You are fasting in his name. And you are doing charitable deeds in his name. Unless there is true love. And where there is true love, there is freedom. And freedom is when the son is not a slave. Slave has no freedom. Only the son has. And that's why the son of God came and became man. Not the father, not the Holy Spirit, but the son. Why? Because in the son there is freedom. And if the son sets you free, truly you are free. He who has the son has life. But he who, has, who does not have the son has no life in him and the wrath of God is bestowed upon him. Christianity is, is a belief in a person called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So what do I need to do in order to be able to do this and this and this and this? One thing, accept the Lord Jesus in your life and let the Lord help you work through you to, be, to enable you to do this and this and this and this. It is the Lord's doing, not mine. My role is to accept him as Lord and Savior and allow him freely to work in my life. And the more I let Jesus work in my life, the more I'll become Christ-like. I'll reflect the Lord more and more in my life. Because the Lord is working in me, guess what? Christ is being revealed in me. Since it's the work of God, is there any human, any angels can do the work of God? Impossible, unless I let God dwell in me and work through me and enable me to do his work through his grace and mercy. This is Christianity. Next time you want to go to church, don't ever make it a duty and look at the watch. Oh, tomorrow is Sunday. I need to go. No. Say, Lord, I cannot wait for Sunday to come. I love you so much. I adore you so much. I cannot wait to be with you. And isn't that the case between you, my beautiful son and daughter? When you, my beautiful boy, fall in love with that girl, that Juliet of your life, you as Romeo, you cannot wait to see Juliet, isn't it, my beloved? When you are with Juliet, do you look at the time and, and, and start huffing and puffing and say, okay, come on. When will this time end? I just want to go back. You never look at the time. Why? Because you are with the one whom you love the most. You are with the one who is the love of your life. And as long as you are with your love, you will never look at the time and you will never want this moment to end. This is the way we need to be with the Lord. It is not rules, guidelines, regulations. It is not duties and obligations. It is naturally, willingly wanting with all of my heart and my being. I want to be with you, Lord. I want to serve you, Lord, because I love you. Because you gave me this love from the very beginning, from on that cross, Calvary. And I'm giving that love back to you. 
And as long as I'm with the love of my life, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, time ceases. Everything else ceases. For when I am with my love, I lose myself in him. He is all of me. And I become all of him. Actually, there is a song. <laughs> I can't remember the lyrics. You are um, all of me and I all of you and something like that. I'm not good at singing. But Jesus needs to be your love. Next time you run to the church, going to church is the result of the love, not the duty. Reading the Bible is the result of the love. Praying is the result of the love. Fasting is the result of that love. Doing charitable deeds in Jesus' mighty name is the result of that love for your Jesus Christ. Christianity is amazing. It is one word, love. This love is that river that came out of Eden to water the garden. And out of this love came out four river heads, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But how did these four river heads come out of this love river? Death. Because love equals sacrifice. And what is sacrifice? Death. I die for the one I love. I sacrifice for the one I love. Parents sacrifice all their life in order for their children to live. Without the sacrifice of the parents, children will die. 100%. You, my son, you, my daughter, now you see yourself mature and you say, I don't need mom and dad. But guess what? Remember, when you were a little baby, who fed you? Who clothed you? Who changed you? Who spent all night long looking after you? Who took you to the doctor when your temperature was high? Was it your friend? No. Was it your cousins? No. Was it any other people? No. It was mom and dad. Why? Because love in parenthood, it is genuine from the heart to the heart. And this genuine love, you will never find it unless in that parenthood. And God in heaven is our daddy and also our mother. Every time you pray, you say, our father who art in heaven. And in Isaiah, the Lord God said, if the mother forgets to breastfeed her babe, I, the Lord, will not, forgive, will not forget you. He reveals himself in Isaiah as the mother and in the Gospels, Matthew and Luke as the father. Genuine love in parenthood. Our Christianity is based on that love. Live Christ with love. Have the relationship with the Lord based on love Therefore, if you truly love the Lord, you need to do what he asks you to do. You need to be obedient to the Lord. Do not be afraid of him. And I'll have to say this. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning to wisdom or the foundation. That's in Aramaic. Rish meaning the head, but the head here does not mean the beginning. It can also mean the foundation. So the foundation to wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now, what is fear of the Lord? Fear of the Lord is not fearing the Lord. There is a difference between fearing the Lord and fear of the Lord. Totally different. Fearing the Lord means... If I do something wrong, I'm afraid he's going to chop my head because he's too powerful, he's too mighty. He's going to throw me in, in hell and I'm going to burn forever. I am fearing him because he can be very harsh with his judgment. But fear of the Lord is the foundation to wisdom. 
I am afraid. I don't want to do anything wrong because I do not want to break his heart. His heart is so full of love. My fear is I don't want to do anything wrong, Lord, because I, the last thing I want to do is break your heart. You are not you should you are you are not worthy of that, Lord. I cannot break your heart. You're too good for your heart to be broken by me. You 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 are so much love. You've given me so much love. The only thing, the least I could do for you is to make you happy with me and let you smile every time you look at your child. Lord, I beg you through your infinite mercy and grace, let me be the child that pleases your heart, that makes, a smi that your, makes your heart smiles and that makes you happy with me. Lord, for I have the fear of you because I do not want to break your heart. I am afraid of breaking your heart. I'm not afraid of you because I know you love me. How can I be afraid of the one who loves me the most and died, was buried and rose from the dead for me? I cannot be afraid of you, but I'm afraid of breaking your heart because I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me and let me be the child that pleases you and glorifies your name through that child. This is the Lord Jesus. And this is Christianity. Everything we do in Christendom and the Christian faith is based on love. There is no obligations. There is no duties. There is no looking at the time. There is natural willingness a natural eagerness and it is a natural instinct in me that I run every time I hear the name of the Lord and everything that is associated with the Lord I love to be there and to do because I love the Lord I love to do everything that he is that he has approved of Don't let anyone force you to do anything. Do it willingly. But if you love the Lord, then you have to do it willingly. God bless you. I pray that this journey with Christ has been nothing but a huge blessing to all, for all of you, my beloveds. I pray that the Lord Jesus has touched your hearts and brought you ever closer to him. The only reason why we preach the Word of God is for you to find Christ. That is the only way it's supposed to be. The preacher is nothing but a speaker. That, that speaker where when the person talks, his voice is heard through that speaker. So I am nothing but that speaker. And the one who is talking through me is the Holy Spirit. God himself, the Messiah dwelling in me in his Holy Spirit. It is the Lord speaking. I'm just carrying that voice to everyone that wishes to hear the voice of the Messiah. Blessed is the soul that opens its heart, that opens its ears to the voice of Christ. For you will be delivered, for you will be saved, for you will be redeemed, for you will be changed forever. For love is the ultimate miracle. It is love that brings life out of death. It is love that raises the dead. It is love that changes darkness into light. It is love that makes hell, heaven. Love is the ultimate. Let us come and enter this relationship with Christ, the King, the Messiah, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us enter this relationship with him based on this love, built on this love. God is love and, God, and love never 
fails. This is my motto in life. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never fails. For God is love. And when you are in God and God is in you and living with him in that love, ye, you will never fail. For God is known for never to fail no one. God bless you. And may this journey with Christ be a blessing to all of you. And may our Christ, our King, our Messiah be that love to every heart and to every relationship. Let the love of Christ dwell in your hearts and be the bond to every relationship there is, whether it be father and son, mother and daughter, husband and wife, brother and sister, friends. Let this divine love, Christ the King, be the bond, the foundation to every relationship. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Well, in a way I feel a bit sad that we're coming to the conclusion of journey with Christ. But you know, on the other hand, I'm not. Because every time we talk about the Lord, it is a journey with Christ. So we've never came out of that journey. In fact, we're going to continue more and more. And until the last drop of my life on earth, I'll continue in this journey with Christ. For there is no other way but Him. There is no other truth but Him. And there is no other life but Him. And I pray through His grace and mercy and the blood that He shed on Calvary, I'll continue this journey with Christ in the next life forever and ever and evermore. Amen. And I pray every single one of you be in the kingdom of God with the Lord Jesus for eternities to come. Amen. So now, this was the last Friday with, Jenny, uh, with Christ. Next Friday, we're going to go back to the commentary on the book of Revelation. We've been receiving a lot of emails and requests from our beloved, beloved people asking, uh, do you have, Bishop Murray, do you have anything on the book of Revelation in English? We could see you've got um, commentary on the book of Revelation in Assyrian. We don't understand Assyrian. And I'm so sorry that you don't understand it. So do you have anything in English? We did start prior to Journey with Christ. It's been now 10 weeks. Prior to these 10 weeks, we did start and, uh, on, on chapter 1 uh, with the book of Revelation. We will go back next Friday, God willing, and we'll continue what we started um, 11 weeks ago. And that'll be the commentary on the book of Revelation in English. And that'll be every Friday at 7 p.m. Your questions are very vital. We did say that send your question and we will answer them on Wednesday, 7 p.m., which is another new program or episode titled Spirit of a Servant. We've, we've seen that by answering those questions, we are coming out of that actual, prog actual concept of uh, how to be a servant in the, in the Lord's house. So we will take those questions of yours and we'll answer some of them on Friday evenings and we'll see how we go. We may find or allocate another time depending. Please do forgive me. I'm extremely busy. Um, so bear with me and pray for me, please, because I definitely and desperately need your prayers and they will help me immensely. So keep me in your prayers, and I can assure you, you are always in my prayers. Um, so um, send your questions, please. We will answer them on Fridays. Maybe a couple of questions here and there, and then we'll go with the uh, commentary on the book of Revelation. But we will leave Wednesdays as spirit of a servant and that concept purely and holy. So we'll be speaking about how to be a successful servant for the Lord Jesus and for his holy house, i.e. the holy church. Um, was there anything else? I don't know. I'm getting old. If I have forgotten, oh yes. Anyone who has sent a request, whether through an email, a message, or called me directly, and I haven't answered, naughty me. I'll smack myself, that's for you. I'll smack myself, I apologize. Please, 
if you don't mind, can you reach out once again? If it's something that you need to talk to us and it's urgent and I haven't been able to get back to you, it is for one reason only, I've been overwhelmed with requests. That's why I haven't been able to reply. So can I please ask you to send your request one more time and bear with me this time and I hopefully will be able to get uh, back to you very, very soon. God bless you. I love you. But Jesus Christ loves you the most. Amen. Let us stand for the finale prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. Lastly, 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 before I leave you with this hymn one more time, I'll be very honest. Um, today when I heard that the Premier of New South Wales had resigned um, from her position, even though we did not agree with um, the rules that they put forth as a government, as a premier, but my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ always taught me to love everyone and to pray for everyone. And I'll say this, whether people will agree or disagree with me, they're absolutely free. But I'm saying this before the almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth and before all of you, my beloveds, I am praying for Gladys and I will always pray for Gladys to be always in good health and in good spirit. And may the Lord Jesus deliver her from every evil tribulation, whether it be visible or invisible. And I pray for every politician, regardless what their position, whether it be high or low, regardless, for every politician, I will pray for them all. We can disagree with them, absolutely, but that does not mean I don't love them, I don't pray for them. These are two separate issues, and we need to always separate them. And as Christians, we should never lose track of our Lord, our good teacher, the teacher of all teachers, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So my dear Gladys, with utmost love and humility, I am praying for you. I can feel your pain and I can feel your sorrows and I can feel your anguish and I can feel the challenges that you are facing. But rest assured, there are people, they may not be worthy to be called Christians. They may not be worthy to be called shepherds in the church of the Lord. They may not be worthy to be standing right now and, and talking to you. But I can assure you, through the mercy of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I was made worthy by him, by his precious blood. I am praying for you, my beloved Gladys. And I pray that you are always close to the Lord. Because I'll say one thing to you, my beloved Gladys. You are my sister in Christ. And you are my daughter in Christ. But I'll say this to you and to everyone. At the end of the day, everything in this realm is vanity of all vanities if we don't have Christ in the equation. What does it benefit a man if he gains the whole world and at the end loses himself? I may lose a position that is fine as long as I don't lose my Savior. It is okay to lose my position as a shepherd, but as long as I don't lose my Jesus, that what really matters, that what lasts forever, because my position on earth is only temporary. I am a shepherd for a moment, but I am the son of God forever. So my beloved sister and daughter in Christ, Gladys Berejiklian, remember this. I'm praying for you. 
I love you in Jesus' mighty name. And I pray that you're always close to the Lord. And whatever the enemy is trying to put, to trap you in it, and to make you fall, may the Lord May the Lord Jesus deliver you. Amen. My beloved, there is nothing more beautiful than love. There is nothing greater than love. And love can only be illustrated, not with the ones that love you only, but more so with the ones that have gone against you. This is the true love. When somebody has hurt you, but you still love them. When somebody has gone against you, but you still love them. When somebody has rejected you, but you still love them and accept them. This is Christ, Jesus in the making. I will go against every tyranny. I will go against against every evil rule and law given by government but I will never rejoice when any politician falls when any human being gets hurt far from it because if I rejoice in the fall of people then I am not a servant of Jesus Christ I will pray for everyone to be saved and delivered in good health and in good spirit so my beloved Gladys, I am saddened to see you go. But I'll say this out of love as a brother and as a spiritual father to you. Lose everything. Don't ever lose Jesus Christ. For the day we lose the Lord, we've lost everything, even if we've got it. It's gone. So nothing is lost, my dear. The Lord is near. And the Lord is here. Hold on to him and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Bring me back to you. Closer than ever more before. For you are the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. I'll leave you with this hymn. God bless.